just a little aside here based on something we were talking about during the Q&A time. I've been thinking a lot recently about how doctrines, or another way to say it is ideas about God, relate to being saved or having a saving personal relation with God or enjoying personal communion with God. And I feel like as I think about this, two things just keep rising with, with equal urgency and I think the history of the church is uh, in some measure falling off on one side or the other when heresies happen. And the two things are this. You've got to break through ideas and doctrines to the person. And the other one is, you can't abandon the ideas and the doctrines because it is precisely through them that you get to the person. And we are, I think, depending on our background. This is why the emergent church exists, I believe. If your background has been doctrinaire and stodgy and it felt like there was no warmth to it, no personal relationship to it, no sweetness to it, no tenderness to it, no reality of heart and soul and mind and emotion to it, and it was all very doctrinal, you're leaving. And where, what are you looking for? You're going behind doctrine. You're going under doctrine. You're going around doctrine. You're getting rid of this thing called doctrine because it has done nothing but mess you up. And you're on a quest for reality and you'll never find it that way. And on the other hand, you got folks who are completely ah doctrinal don't want to talk about doctrine and they're just totally into experience all kinds of dreams and visions and prophetic words and miracles and just immediacy is where it's at immediacy not mediated relationship immediate relationship that's a dead end street because there's no way to tether it in you can't shape it you can't give it any any biblical form. So I hope God will be merciful to us and that He will not let us sink in a morass of subjectivity that has no contours, no borders, and no biblical control or guidance or faithfulness. Just more buzzes and more experiences and pushing the limits always and trying to figure out more clever ways with smoke and mirrors and everything possible to get more stuff going on in here without having to do this doctrine thing. I hope the Lord would deliver us from that. And over here, I hope that those of us who give our whole lives to trying to, to Sunday after Sunday, say with words, sentences, and ideas in things called sermons what's faithful to this book will never find ourselves terminating with pleasure, intellectual pleasure, on the ideas themselves. Calvinists are prone to like to think. It is a demanding vision. People who like to think often have a hard time distinguishing between the pleasures of thinking about God and the pleasures of knowing God. And that's the challenge over here. All of that in response to your question about how much you have to know and get right in order to be right with God 
It's not a simple thing. One more observation about that, as long as I'm on a roll here. <laughs> Just, this is so front burner for me. Um, it helps me a lot to compare the inspiration of the Bible to the incarnation of the Son of God. So, if you walk up to the Son of God, Jesus, in the flesh, and say, show us the Father. Jesus is going to say, have I been so long with me, with you, and you don't know me? And you say, well, but what I meant was I want to see beneath you, I want to see behind you, I want to see through you, I want... And Jesus says, you can't go to him that way. It's me in the flesh, or no other way. Now the analogy is sentences, verbs, subjects, objects. This is divinely inspired. If you go to this book and say, show me the Word of God, the Word is going to say, have you read me so often and you don't know? And you're going to say, but I mean behind you, beneath you, through you, beyond you. I want something other than you. The Word will say, there is no other way. Through, yes, but not instead of. Pretty profound things going on there between incarnation and inspiration. Think about it. We're still on unconditional election. And now here's the key question between the two big systems. Is God's election based upon His foreknowledge of your freely chosen faith? That's the classic Arminian position. Yes, there's election in the Bible, can't deny that. So you go to this passage here, Romans 8, and you see this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed, to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, <coughs> those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's stop there. Pretty natural reading, isn't it? To say that predestination is based on foreknowledge and to assume that election is in here and not back here or in here. So there would be the classic text for where an Arminian would conclude that first there's foreknowledge and then there's election, predestination, and then there's calling, and then there's justification, and then there's glorification. Now, the question is, is that what foreknew means here? Does foreknow in this text mean God is aware ahead of time of what we by our ultimate self-determination will do in response to the gospel, namely believe. And foreseeing that free ultimate self-determination choice, he then says on the basis of that I now, in eternity, elect you 
to be mine. And so election is fundamentally a response to my free choice. Is that what's happening? Now, up till now, if, if you've been on track with me till now, you would simply say, it can't be. Because we've seen in irresistible grace and total depravity and so far in John that God's enabling us to believe is based upon his election, not the other way around. However, let's just hold that and let this text have its say and ask, but, but could this mean that? And if so, then we might have to adjust everything else we've seen so far. Now, <clears throat> let me do two things. Let me give you a, a little biblical primer on the kind of knowing that may be meant here and probably is, and then look contextually at something here that won't let it work that way. So here's some text on the kind of knowing that's implied. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man. So this kind of use of the word know is not uncommon in the Bible. To know is to have a relationship with, connect with, had sex in this case. Here's the significant one. In Genesis 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen, now that's the ESV translation there, but it's the Hebrew yada, I have known him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So there God is saying, I have known him that he may do this. So knowing there is virtually synonymous with election as this translation is suggesting. And then Amos 3.2 says to Israel, you only, God says to Israel, you only have I known of all the families on the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for your iniquities. What does he mean when he says, I've only known Israel? I don't know Midian, and I don't know the Canaanites, I don't know the Jebusites, and I don't know Moab, and I don't know Edom. I just know you. What, what does he mean by that? And, and the answer is, I've only formed a relationship with you. I've only set my... The closest thing we have in English might be the word acknowledge. Acknowledge. So if, if, if we have a discussion here and I go, I acknowledge you, what, we, what I mean is I choose you to speak next. So you got everybody's his hand up and I acknowledge. That's the closest I can think of to a, the use of the word no or the stem no in English to this kind of no. To acknowledge, to set one's um, awareness on in a choosing way. We just, hard to do it in English. But there it is several times in Hebrew. Here's one more. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and in everything he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now what does that mean? It doesn't mean that he's unaware of the way of the wicked. So awareness is not the issue here with this kind of use of the word no. It is relationship and acknowledgement. You see and you put your knowledge, you put your consciousness, you put your choosing relational sights upon something. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He attends to it. He acknowledges it. He owns it for his own. Now, back to 
Romans. So we should at least consider the possibility when it says here, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, that it means those whom he acknowledges, those whom he chose. And then the word predestined simply, it does, it's not equal to election, it never does mean election. Predestination means you are destining the elect for a certain future. And in this case, conformity to Jesus. So my, <coughs> excuse me, my interpretation of these, verse 29, is that for no here is synonymous with election. Those whom he chose, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Now, are there any clues in the text to that effect? And here is the, the clearest one to me. You have to let yourself now feel the entire flow of the text so that you're reading along. You got other things Paul has said in the book, in your mind or in 1 Corinthians, especially about the call of God. Let me remind you, 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but... Uh, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Meaning, the call effected the view of the cross as true, powerful, beautiful, and no longer a stumbling block and no longer foolishness. It's the call that did that. So the call creates Sight, the call creates life. Lazarus, come forth. That's the kind of call that is meant by Paul when he speaks of the call to salvation. Now, keep that in mind, and we'll read on. Those whom he foreknew, <coughs> those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, and those whom he predestined, he called. And these whom he called, you're justified. Now, everything up till now in Romans has taught one thing about justification. It is by faith alone. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And he's saying, every single person, no exception, who's called is justified. So some big things are being assumed here. What? Faith. Every one of those called people believed. Really? Every single one of them. Everyone who's called is justified. There's no dropouts. There's no exceptions. The called are justified, which must mean the called have their faith effected by the call which means God is not foreknowing self-wrought faith. That's what, that's what turned this text for me. It won't work. It just won't work in the flow. Once you get down to realize all the called are justified and only believers are justified therefore all the called are brought to faith and it is not a contingency like a few of them believe and a few of them don't because they're got their ultimate self-determination no they don't have ultimate self-determination when God calls effectually they see and believe and are justified, and there are no dropouts, and there are no exceptions. All the called are justified because all the called believe, and therefore Paul cannot be operating with the Arminian notion that what God foresaw in the preaching of the gospel was that the gospel would be sounded forth, and something other than a sovereign call would bring about faith and justification. Will work. So, my answer to this classic text brought up against unconditional election is it's not 
a successful counter argument. This word for no here, both in the wider meaning of the Bible and in the immediate demands of the context, doesn't mean was aware ahead of time of human beings using ultimate self-determination to put their faith in Christ and thus deciding who will populate the people of God apart from God's choosing. It won't work. And when you come to a text like this one in Acts 13, you get a profound confirmation of it. Paul's preaching in the synagogue, and when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. <coughs> For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. This is election. The Arminian scheme that says God foresees this bringing this about contradicts this text clearly. It is this that brings this about. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Just the fact that Luke, Luke chooses to say that should amaze us because he didn't have to say it. He could have just said, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying God, and many put their faith in the Lord. Just wonderful. We don't praise God. The Gentiles are believing. Awesome. They're becoming part of the people of God. And Luke, for reasons that I assume prompt the existence of this seminar, <laughs> says, out of, out of his way, he says, the ones who believed, if you have any question about why they believed, the answer is, they had been appointed to eternal life. The reason you do not believe is because you not, are not of my sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They're appointed to eternal life. You go preach in synagogues, you go preach in marketplaces, my sheep hear my voice and they respond. I'm going to uh, try to develop very briefly Paul's argument in Romans 9 for God's justice in unconditional election. He starts in chapter 9, verse 3, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. What that means is my kinsmen, that is my Jewish kinsmen, are damned. They are cut off from Christ and under the curse. And if it were possible, I would take their place. But, lest you be too shocked 
that Jewish people, God's own people, could be lost. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. Why not? Because not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, not all Jews belong to true Israel, that is the elect. Then he argues for that on the basis of Abraham having Ishmael and Isaac, and Isaac being chosen, not Ishmael. And then Isaac and uh, Rebekah having Jacob and Esau, and God choosing Jacob, not Esau. Gives these illustrations where among those who are physically seed do not become spiritual heirs. And he's showing the electing distinctions of God. So it comes down to verse 12 and 13. Um, these twins in the womb, though they were not yet born, <coughs> though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election, that's the goal, might stand not because of works, but because of Him. He didn't say works faith, he said works Him. Him who calls, there's the call. She was told the older will serve the younger. So God reversed the expected order in the womb and predicted whom He would choose. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. This is a quote from Malachi 1, 1 through 3. And this hatred here, as shocking as it sounds, if you look at it in context, and you can hear my sermon on Malachi 1 by going back to the ZG website, really is morally suitable because even though the choice was made of Jacob over Esau before they were born, the warrant for God's judgment is fully demonstrated in the wickedness of the people themselves as they develop. Now, there's the problem, all right? Unconditional election of Jacob over Esau, unconditional election of Isaac over Ishmael, and unconditional election of all those who are in true Israel. What shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? I spent Nine months doing nothing in 1979 but trying to figure that sentence out and wrote the book, The Justification of God. So if you want to read 240 pages of explanation of that verse, that's what I did. So I'm going to give you the fruit in five minutes of what I think this means. Is there then injustice? Paul is not oblivious to our problems, right? He's not oblivious to what his teaching sounds like. He knows our problems. You say, before they're born, or done anything good or evil, Jacob, I love Esau, I hated. <laughs> You're unjust. That's what he hears people say. And so he asks, is there injustice on God's part? And he answers, no. And his reason is mind-boggling. Here's his argument. No. For Moses said in Exodus 33, 19, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. What kind of an argument is that? That restates the problem. Or does it? it? Might take you nine months to figure that out. If you, if you credit, if you, you don't get snooty with the Bible. There are so many commentaries that get snooty at this point. They just mock the Bible on Romans 9. Just appalling how many Christian pastors and teachers there are who mock the Bible. Who look at its plain assertions and scoff. 
scoff that anybody could believe them. Well, I don't want to be in that number. It's scary to be in that number. I want to be respectful and say, Paul, I don't get it. I need help. Help me understand this argument. Because you said, no, there's no injustice in your free choice of Jacob over Esau because Moses said, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Are you just saying, shut up. This is the way I do it. He has a right to say that. He can say that to me. But it looks like he's written some, he's trying to help me. He's writing. He's trying to help me. He's not saying shut up. He's, he's, he goes on and on with trying to help me here. And so I want to get help. So what I did was I went back and I read it in context. So here it is. This is the place that he quotes as a defense that God is not unjust in choosing Jacob over Esau freely apart from anything in them. This is Moses dealing with God about whether he'll go up with them into the promised land. And God is upset with them because of their sin and Moses is pleading that God won't leave them alone and will go with them. And so he says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, he's still not satisfied. He's going to get more. He's got God's commitment to go with him now, but he wants more. Please, show me your glory. And God said, now this is his answer. I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. I think the answer is in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere. The answer why Paul would quote this as an explanation that there is no injustice on God's part in choosing Jacob over Esau before they were born. And I'll try to sum up the argument like this. And it took 240 pages to defend it. I believe that in asking to see God's glory, God in fact does in this response provide a glimpse of His glory and something right at the heart of what His glory is. He is Yahweh and you remember very similarly grammatically to this, Yahweh arose from the statement, I am who I am. That is grammatically a very similar structure to, I will be gracious, to whom I will be gracious. So he's, the, the Lord is my name, and here is what my name at its heart means, or at least includes. I am free. What, what does this mean? I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. What's the point of saying that? The point of saying that is to distinguish God's choices from those who show mercy on the basis of what others do. Who are gracious on the basis of what others do. God chooses to be gracious to whom He chooses to be gracious. God's willing is traced back to God. God wills because He wills. He chooses because He chooses. 
And I'm arguing it belongs to the very definition of the glory of God that God be free like that in all of his action. That he be free, that he not be constrained by any powers or contingencies from outside himself. That when God choose a thing, he choose it freely. Never constrained by others. Never constrained by forces outside himself. It's his glory to be free. It's his godness to be free. Which means, when he chose Jacob over Esau, he did it in absolute freedom. He was not coerced or constrained or limited or decisively affected by anything in them. Is he unjust to do that? No, because he is acting in complete freedom, as Moses said, and in that context, this is what it means to be infinitely glorious, which left one last step in the argument. What's the meaning of justice in God? What's the meaning of righteousness in God? And I'm rebuilding arguments from the inside out. I'm trying not to come on this. I'm trying to think the structure out from the inside. And my conclusion is, in Paul's mind, the heart of the righteousness of God is his unswerving allegiance to always uphold his glory. His unswerving allegiance always to display and vindicate and magnify and uphold his glory. So here's the argument. Oh, I thought I had it summed up somewhere. There it is. God's justice or righteousness is his unwavering commitment to uphold and display the worth of his glory. I, I, I developed lots of text to try to show that. Second, his freedom from all external constraints is an essential aspect of his glory. Therefore, to act in freedom is essential to his glory and thus to his righteousness and therefore No. In exercising that freedom for the upholding of that glory, in choosing Jacob over Esau, he is acting in complete justice. He was doing what justice demands of him. That is what the infinite worth of his glory requires. If he had not acted in freedom here, he would have been unjust. That is, he would not have justly acted in accordance with the worth of his glory. End of argument. That's heavy. And <clears throat> it may be that you just will say, okay, maybe, and I'll just accept that God is right and good and true in what he does. Let me draw this part to a close on election. In fact, finish election, and that's all we'll do in this session. By looking at a few texts that call unconditional election into question, there are texts that are raised immediately in opposition to everything we've been saying. This is the first one. Paul says, first of all, then I urge entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings to be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
So if you say that you're a Calvinist or that you believe in unconditional election, a Bible person, uh, even if they're sympathetic with you, will wonder what you do with this. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. If God chooses Jacob over Esau before they were born, uh, how does this text work? Doesn't he desire Jacob to be saved? And you said he chose Jacob over Esau before they had done anything. That's a good question. You ought to ask that question. Howard Marshall has written a scholarly commentary on it, and here is very telling words. He's not a Calvinist, but he's a, usually a pretty good exegete. To avoid all misconceptions, it should be made clear at the outset that the fact that God wishes or wills that all people should be saved does not necessarily imply that all will respond to the gospel and be saved. So that's true. So Arminians and Calvinists agree on that. We must certainly distinguish between what God would like to see happen and what he actually does will to happen. That surprised me coming out of his mouth. That's right, you should say that, but it just surprised me because he's setting himself up for big trouble. And both of these things can be spoken of as God's will. Absolutely they can, and they are in the Bible. You see what he's saying? I didn't expect him to. I thought only Calvinists talked this way. That you have one level of willing he would like to see happen. Desires all men to be saved. And you have another level of willing. Both can be spoken of as God's will. So the question at issue is not whether all will be saved. This is still him talking but whether God has made provision in Christ for the salvation of all, provided that they believe. And without limiting the potential scope of the death of Christ, merely to those whom God knows will believe. I have no problem with that. No problem. I'm okay. I don't think limited atonement even contradicts what he just says here. If you listen if you read very carefully, I'll just zero problem with everything he's written on that page. <clears throat> but nowhere in the entire essay does Marshall mention the fact, mention the one text in the pastoral epistles that point most clearly to these two wills and what they are. Namely, this text right here. So let's read it. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance. God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. That sounds familiar. That sounds real familiar. Like 1 Timothy 2.4. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So since it sounds so familiar, one is prompted to go back and do this. Let's compare 1 Timothy 2.4 and 2 Timothy 2.25. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Ace epignosine alitheus. Come. 2 Timothy 2.25 God may grant them repentance unto a knowledge of the truth. Ace epignosin alitheus. That is remarkable. Now, 
Marshall poses the question whether any text in the pastorals would lead us to believe that, quote, faith and repentance are the gifts of God who gives them only to the previously chosen group of the elect. He poses that question on page 66. And he concludes there is not, even though the text that comes closest to saying this very thing, he skips totally. I don't like that. Not from scholars, I don't. Scholars should know better. Look at this. He is posing the question, is there any clue in the pastoral epistles that this wish of God here, that all people would come to a knowledge of the truth, is somehow only given by God to certain people? And the answer is, absolutely, yes, there is a text. It says that very thing, namely 2 Timothy 2.25. God may grant them repentance unto a knowledge of the truth. You can't even, you can't even bend the words. They're the same. The pastoral epistles show us how we dare not interpret chapter 2, verse 4 of the first epistle. We dare not take these words, God desires all people to be saved, to imply he does not give repentance to some. We can't take it to mean that. So how shall we take it? What shall we say? Here's the upshot. Both Calvinists and Arminians agree that not all are saved because God desires all to be saved. So we're all on the same page there. We say he desires, and I'm saying he desires all to be saved. Both agree that some other purpose of God intervenes to prevent this desire from being fulfilled. Some other purpose of God, that's what Marshall said, intervenes to prevent this one from saving everybody. The Arminian says that God's purpose to grant ultimate self-determination intervenes. So if you were to ask an Arminian, and this is don't, no caricature here, just bona fide, intelligent, born again Arminian, why do you think everybody's not saved if God wishes everybody to be saved? His answer is free will. That's his answer. Meaning, God has a purpose that you have free will, and that's more important, all things considered, than that everybody be saved. Because they would say, you make robots out of everybody, if you save everybody. So God's purpose is not be robots, have genuine self-determination, and that purpose intervenes and prevents his wish that all be saved from coming true. Now, the question is, is that a good explanation? Is that a biblical explanation? It's an explanation, it's just not a biblical one. Because self-determination is not taught in the Bible. It's assumed, it's brought to the Bible by philosophical presuppositions that most Arminians are, are born with, namely all of us. We're born with the assumption that we have ultimate self-determination and you can't have moral accountability without it. The Calvinist says that God's purpose, which intervenes and prevents this from happening, is to save incomplete freedom and for the glory of his name, those whom he has chosen. So God has a genuine desire. You may have a hard time dealing with that. I do. I'm going to say it. <clears throat> At one level, God desires all people to be saved, just like Arminians say that. 
And then Armenians say, but he doesn't save all people because he ranks free will in the general scope of things to be more important than did he save everybody. And Calvinists say, uh, that's not the biblical answer. The biblical answer is that God elects unconditionally whom he will save for his purposes to glorify his freedom and his name. And therefore, that's why in his wisdom, he doesn't save everybody that he desires to save. These are the other two texts that are going to be brought up in response. He is patient toward you. That's an important word here. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And I would simply say the same thing about that text that I did about the other. That's true. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. But he has purposes for why that desire is not realized. Here's the Ezekiel response. Do I have pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, rather than he should turn from his ways and live? God's deepest pleasure is not in the death of the wicked. God doesn't delight in hell the way he delights in heaven. God doesn't delight in damnation the way he delights in salvation. They're not parallel, not equivalent emotions in the heart of God. And here is one of the clearest texts, and I'll stop with this one. This one helped me so much. It's clues like this that make you shape your brain around the Bible rather than bring into the Bible what it has to mean. This is Lamentations. The Lord will not reject forever. Lamentations 3, 31. For if he causes grief, he'll have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. Because, well, you Hebrew knowers, not afflict malevo from his heart, from heart his. He does not afflict from his heart and grieve sons of man. What does this mean? Literally it is, he does not afflict them from his heart. What an amazing phrase for God. Like He does afflict them, but it's not coming from his heart. Which means there are levels of willing in God. He can desire that all people be saved. He can desire that people not perish. He can take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he can will that for wise, holy, and just purposes, this aspect of his desiring, knowing, willing will be subordinated to the larger picture of glorifying his name by the preservation of his freedom, which is an essential part of his glory and the definition of his justice. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I praise you that you are God and we are not. That you are absolutely free and there are many imponderable things. How inscrutable are your ways and how ins unsearchable are your judgments. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has ever given a gift to him that he should be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever.